Yeah. But in looking at his style, I mean, he's obviously an engineer by trade. I think engineering was obviously his forte. And being a wood merchant, I think, was even more important because all of his designations, he was described as a wood merchant rather than an architect. So he seems to have been proud of the fact that he was a merchant in, in handling wood. And obviously, because we don't know whether he was actually a trained architect, you see, but I think Rory, the style of architecture he used was very much eclectic, because he just used, I mean, I was, I was recently in Suriname, for example, and I was looking at the Dutch architecture, which is very beautiful, and very worthy of the fact that it got so much out of it. But most of it is very Dutch. It's very Dutch 18th century stuff, and some of it is very monotonous. It's beautiful. It's white, it's clean, it's pretty. But a lot of it is very repetitive. Whereas I think the architecture in Guyana is much more flamboyant. Much more individual style is taking place, really. Uh, because we, the Dutch architecture is much very much a box with a roof, with a few turrets and whatever. But most of the architecture we find in Guyana tends to pick on different styles, from the Renaissance to the Gothic. And it's a wonderful mixture using that particular style of architecture in wood. And the fact that he had the woodworking factory obviously gave him an advantage to experiment in terms of putting wood together, whether it was joinery or carving or fretwork to that extent. And um, with that, he obviously introduced quite a lot of decorative elements into the architecture as well. And influence of international style, not just pure speculation, because obviously we don't know how much he absorbed. In that. We know he traveled overseas to London, for example. So where he lived in Bloomsbury, he must have in his backyard would have been the British Museum, which had the large neoclassical building. We had places like University College London with large neoclassical buildings. We had the Euston Station with large. So he must have seen a lot of um, classical architecture. And where he lived in Bloomsbury, he actually lived in a house which, funnily enough, was recorded as a very important Georgian house. And when we see another photograph of that house again, we see where that house is a typical Georgian style building with casement windows, but it has a lot of ironwork as well in, in balconies, which was used a lot in the Victorian and, and architecture. Um, and of course, influence of local people, he must obviously was contemporary with Castellani and um, Scholes. So it'd be interesting, I don't know whether anybody has done a study on that, to compare a comparative of the three architects, how they, how they, how they live together. Because Sharples may well have been supplying timber to these architects for all we know, may well have been supplying iron work to them. And uh, not only that, Castellani lived in Middle Street. Sharples also lived in Middle Street, so they must have been fairly close neighbors. So they must have seen each other's buildings going up and down. And of course, Ignatius Scholes was a bit of a snob, I suppose. He, his father was an architect, and he was a trained architect as well. And Scholes, I think, was very much an architectural purist. And I think he looked down a bit on engineers to some extent. OK, we talk about the sort of vernacular architecture, really, which is obviously an architecture looking at local needs. Um, I mean, I suppose when one, using the term vernacular architecture tends to be very sort of cliched, really. One tends to, I like to think of something different to call it, but let's call it vernacular architecture, which he sort of created. And obviously, the labor force produced in the, in the wood factories was fairly cheap labor, so they were able to do lots of the crafting and the hard work. Obviously, Gann had a variety of very good timber, and we know from when he built the railway cabins and things like that, he obviously used different woods, cedar woods and all manner of woods. And uh, when it comes to adopting for local needs, then that's where we find the wonderful things in, in, in the building architecture. Because if you look at all the fenestration buildings, we find a huge variety of casement windows to the famous Demerara shutters, the jealousies. And a lot of it depended when you worked around the sense that they were all built for the environment. You know, the, the, the Demerara window is a wonderful thing, really, because it not only acts as a sort of agent for shade, it also acts as an agent for privacy, because it's nothing better than sitting in the Amrara and being able to look down and look out. Um, it always, you know, sheltered from the rain. And obviously one got the, the ventilation coming in. So I think a lot of that arch old architecture really, I mean, this building is a typical example. You're sitting here now without any air conditioning and feeling, well, I know tra putting a traffic aside, one feels the benefit of, you know, the open lattice work on the open windows really. So, he built obviously in the tradition. So when we look at his housing, we can see very much his use of windows was very much part of the design, overall design of the building. Okay. I put these two in because when one thinks of influences, one can only speculate. 
the church on the left um, is, is, that's the church where he got married in Switzerland. No, it's so he must have seen that building when he went there in 1885, because that's where they got married. Heaven knows how it was arranged. It was this collegiate, some collegiate college, which I think still exists. Right? So you can see the building is just pure um, 16th century Gothic. And, and this is the other building in London where he lives, in the, um, very much a Georgian building. Oh, a very famous Lewis's, actually, a very famous bookshop Lewis's. I don't think they exist anymore. So he lived above there. And as you can see, the use of ironwork and the use of um, other features of George. It means a very simple, basic building. But in the Survey of London of 1949, this building gets very special mentions as an excellent example of an 18th century Georgian townhouse. So as you can see, in speculation, he must have come across this type of architecture. Whether it influenced him or not, we don't know. But at least he had that exposure to architecture in London at the time. Okay. I put these two up anyway because we know he went to Switzerland. That's an example of a wooden Swiss uh, chalet building in Switzerland. And this little building on the Thames, which is pure Sharples, belonged to Charles Dickens on the Thames. So looking at the features of it with the barge boards and even some of the woodwork, which could be actually you know, executed in iron when you think of it, is something we can imagine him building with the... Um, So, I mean, I just used those as sort of speculative um, bits of building, which could be, not that he was influenced, but what was being built at the time, really. 